part of your day to day, you work a lot with the private sector to exchange and share information. And, and I think a lot of, uh, of our audience also think that's possibly some tension between the private sectors in terms of uh, priorities, right? So, for example, private sector, when it comes to ransomware, may be more interested in restoring the operations, but law enforcement are more interested in preserving the information, right, for forensic analysis. Um, and sometimes, perhaps, our private sector is more interested in preserving the privacy of the individuals involved, but law enforcement will probably prioritize on, you know, taking down the, the group. So, how do you see all these different conflicting priorities? What are some of the biggest challenges that you see? Okay, uh, when I was uh, in my police officer work in Brazil, usually I have this conflict. So we go to a crime scene for um, a ransomware attack and we, we want to preserve evidence. And the, the, the affected entity is uh, more concerned about restoring their environment. And this has a natural conflict because restoring the environment may destroy evidence. So this is a very hard time for you to talk to them and say, okay, you can restore, you, you can't get in the way. So you can't deny them to restore their environment because it's their business. But you can try to find a little balance about this. So you need to preserve evidence as restoring. And the attack itself also destroys evidence. So this is a very hard game to play. And every case is different. But from an Interpol perspective, uh, we usually don't go on the ground. We don't do incident response in the countries. We are more in the uh, receiving information and cooperating with different countries. So sometimes some law enforcement agency comes with us and say, hey, I have a case of this group. We did the forensic. We got this evidence. And we see this, uh, let's see, this uh, hosting providers in, the, in other countries. So what we do is we, we work very closely with the operations uh, division inside the Cybercrime Directorate, and we try to reach the countries and get them to sit together and say, hey, let's do a global operation. You can disrupt this infrastructure. You have the victims, and you have the threat actors. So this is the, the, the hard work, and as you said, it takes a long time, so we need to be patient. Something we do, for example, we send an intelligence package to one country, it can come to fruition one, two, three years later. That's right, yeah. So you don't control on how the information is used. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. what we do is we send information when we hope that the countries have do good use of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you work with many different countries, and obviously uh, you also mentioned in your talk earlier that some of these um, cultural, bar uh, cultural barriers, language barriers, right? And there's also this uh, very often asked question about data sovereignty, like how... How do you exchange and share information if there is some rules and regulations around what kind of data can or cannot leave the country? So how do you see like some of these international sort of cooperation? Okay, uh, Interpol has its own regulations for uh, what we call the rules of processing of data. So when we receive something from a country, the country can flag that they don't want this information to be shared with specific countries. So this is a very tight setup we, we do and we need to comply to that. So the country can say, I will give you this information, but you can't share this information with these countries. So this is very specific and the rules are very specific. So Interpol has a time, the data is, does not belong to Interpol, the data belongs to the country. And we are like the, the holders of the data for a specific amount of time. And I think it's an unavoidable question. How is AI going to impact or will AI impact the way that you gather intelligence and analyze it? Okay, uh, I think we, we are discussing a lot about uh, prompts like GPT and you see all this advertisement on, on social media that if you are not using this, this, this tool, you're doing it wrong. But I, I believe more as AI as a productivity enhancer. So uh, you see today you are writing messages and it's predicting your words. Today it's making your presentations more beautiful. So it's organizing your photos. So I think the, the, the AI will boost productivity. And this has both sides. So this will enhance productivity for defenders, but will also enhance productivity for attackers. So we are going to see uh, less capable attackers doing very sophisticated attacks because be, they are being 
aided by technology, by AI, to do more sophisticated attacks. But also, I think uh, defenders will release new products that can adapt right. to new attacks using AI. So I think it goes both sides. But it's very interesting to see how fast this is developing. And I'm, I'm, I really believe on what I call uh, uh, is invisible AI. It's that AI that is embedded in the things you already use. Let's say WhatsApp you already use. At some point in time, it starts to predict what you are writing, so it in increases your productivity. And you don't need to learn anything new. It's just there. You write an email on Gmail and it's predicting your words. So it's like, uh, as I said, invisible. So it's already there. So this is the transformation. So I think every piece of technology changes how we do stuff. That's right. Yeah. And we keep getting dependent on them. That's why cybercrime is so scary because we depend more and more on technology. Today, if a, if a, a company gets ransomed, they can go out of business because they rely so much on technology to get stuff going that you can't, like the colonial pipeline attack, you can't sell gas because you can't, uh, you, you don't have the resources to build them and to get uh, the money in. So this is very uh, scary perspective from one side, but this, uh, you, we don't need to see this as a bad thing in the whole because you have more time for other stuff. Exactly, that's right, yeah. Well, you also pointed out in your presentation that without technology, there won't be any ransomware, right?